Gotcha. Oh, they must have taken it out. Yeah. Do you have any audio in your presentation? No. Okay. We're good. Thank you. Yep. trajectory one? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, welcome everybody. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? No? Not loud enough? I'm gonna have to lean in here. All right. <laughs> All right, now can you hear me okay? All right. Um, well, welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm Ben Jedlovec, the president of Baseball Info Solutions, and I'm here to talk to you today about trajectory-based uh, defense and pitching statistics, or hitting and pitching statistics, sorry, um, and defense independence and, uh, and the kind of some of the things we can do with that. Um, I had the good fortune two years ago to present uh, some information here at this conference on uh, batted ball profiles of hitters and pitchers, looking at you know the hitters and pitchers with different types of of batted balls, whether they be high fly balls or uh, or a lot of line drives, you know, shallow line drives, or a lot of uh, hard ground balls, soft ground balls, etc. Um, and this year, I'm or today, I'm building off of a lot of that. And uh, so, those of you I'm, uh, who were here for the presentation two years ago, you're going to get a quick refresher. Uh, those of you who haven't, uh, who weren't here two years ago, you're going to get a, a quick introduction, recap of that, and uh, then we're going to dig in and, and build off of that a few more steps uh, down the road. So. Um, all right, uh, first of all, I'm working with Baseball Info Solutions timer data, and uh, this includes batted ball timer information for fly balls, which is the hang time, as well as uh, ground balls in line. Uh, for ground balls, we're tracking the time of the ball through the infield, uh, so we can get its velocity, at, you know, its average velocity traveling through the infield that way. Uh, we're combining that with uh, hit locations and our batted ball data to get uh, you know, essentially the trajectory, the information about the trajectory of the batted ball. Um, uh, we've used this in our defensive analytics in the fielding Bible. We've built our defensive system around this information to get uh, an approximation of the difficulty of every batted ball. So we, we can say that this batted ball was uh, fielded by the, the league on average about 57% of the time for an out uh, and 43% of the time for a hit or an error. Um, so we use that on the defensive side, but uh, what we're talking about today is, is turning that around and using that for hitters and for pitchers. And what can we learn about hitters and pitchers uh, from this same type of approach? Uh, and what this really gets into is, is defense independence statistics, uh, defense independent batting statistics, defense independent uh, pitching statistics. Uh, and I use defense independence, a quick note, just kind of a sidebar on this. I'm going to continue using these terms. Um, but, uh, but it's more than just defense independence. It's, you know, it gets into parks, it gets into other factors that we might you know, just attribute to luck because they tend to even out over the long run or maybe they don't. Um, so uh, we use this term defense independence a little bit lightly in this case uh, because it's more than just defense independence that we're going for here. Um, and I haven't come up with a creative acronym uh, other, than, other than to borrow defense independent pitching statistics from Voros. I don't, Voros is probably somewhere here. Uh, Voros is over here. Um, who uh, came up with the idea for defense independent pitching statistics and what we're really uh, breaking this into is is taking that a couple steps further and determining exactly how much control do pitchers and batters have over those balls in play and how much is attributable to the defense or other factors. Um, and I know well some of you guys have, have uh, had a lot of success creating some creative and catchy acronyms in the past so maybe one of you guys can help me come up with a better name for this. but. Um, I'm going to first take you through ground balls, uh, and what I've got here, uh, excuse me as I, as I turn here, I'll probably lose you on the microphone. Uh, so over in the top uh, left corner, well, let me walk you through the graph first. We have batted ball velocity on the x-axis, uh, and we have out ratio, the, the percentage of the time that the play goes for an out on the y-axis. And uh, what this graph is showing us here is we got the dribblers, the slow ground balls uh, here on the left side, the top left side. that. Uh, they get out in front of the catcher, but in front of the pitcher as well, and they have to, you know, pounce on it, try to get the, uh, get the ball to first base in time. Those aren't always fielded for outs, about, uh, you know, 70% of the time, uh, based off of this graph. 
Uh, if, the, if the batter hits it a little bit harder, we have a routine ground ball. Infielder sucks it up, gets it over to first base. Those are converted for outs 90% of the time or more. Uh, and then the harder that the batter hits the ball, uh, the more likely it is to get through the infield and go for a hit. So this is intuitive, common sense. We're just creating a model here to kind of use this information to our benefit. Um, of course, one important variable on ground balls is speed. So as you would expect, the faster guys tend to beat out ground balls more often than the slower guys. Uh, all right, so uh, here's, you can see the yellow is the, uh, the slow guys uh, on ground balls. We have the same curve for both the slow guys and the fast guys. Um, and the slow guys uh, were, were converted, uh, their ground balls were converted for outs about 15, 20% more often, particularly on the left side of this graph where, uh, where the ball in place hit a little bit slower and, and their speed comes into, more into play than on the right side of this graph where the question is more, uh, did it get through the infield or not? So, uh, so this is an important variable that when we're looking at individual hitters, we're certainly going to need to adjust for, right? Uh, so we'll come back to that later. Uh, fly balls and, and, ball and line drives here. Uh, we created this graph. Uh, we kind of call it tornado plots because you can kind of see like a shape of a tornado here. I grew up in Alabama and they have a lot of tornadoes down there, so I kind of like that. But um, anyways, uh, on the x-axis we have distance from home plate. On the y-axis we, uh, we have hang time. Uh, I'll, I'll use the pointer over here for you guys uh, so I don't neglect you entirely too. But, um, the, uh, so if we use the top, the top left of the graph here is the, the pop-ups region. Uh, and those are the ones that don't go very far and they are hit high into the air, okay? Uh, the background image here, the red and the yellow, indicates whether uh, or the likelihood that a given ball is going to be converted for an out. So the yellow is, are the regions where, where the balls are likely outs, the red are the region where they're likely hits, and then you've got some gradient in there where there's an orange region uh, where it's somewhere in the middle. So let me walk you through the rest of this graph. So we've got the pop-ups in the top left corner. Uh, down here, we've got line drives uh, at about you know, 200 feet in a couple of seconds, just a couple of seconds in the air. Uh, the higher they hang in the air, the more likely they're going to be outs. You, know, you get bloop singles in here, and then they turn into those, uh, those kind of in-between uh, infield and outfield pop-ups that somebody, one of the three or four fielders tracks down if they hang, hang in the air long enough. Um, over here, we got the routine fly balls, you know, a big, a nice little uh, bulge in our yellow here for where outfielders traditionally get to, uh, to these fly balls, about 300 feet and, and a few seconds, several seconds in the air. Um, and then lastly, as we get closer to the right edge of the graph, we get back into the extra base hit territory, and then ultimately the balls are going over the fence. The further you hit the ball, the more likely it is to be a hit because it's, it's going to go over the fence. So uh, all of this, again, is intuitive. This is just a way of, of visually displaying kind of the model we're going to be working with. Um, so if you imagine every fly ball, you know, just, just plot it on here and kind of in your mind uh, try to approximate how, you, how often you think that ball would, uh, would go for a hit. So uh, let's say you have a 250 foot fly ball that hangs in the air for like three seconds. You know, that could be one of those no man's land that, uh, that could fall in. It might not be in the air long enough for an outfielder or an infielder to quite get underneath it. Uh, it might be 50-50 whether it goes for a hit or an out. Uh, if he hits it a little bit deeper, it might be something that uh, they could go for a double or a single. So one of the points here is actually, um, uh, let me skip ahead two slides because I'm going to come back to this, but uh, we're going to get away from just looking at the results of the balls in play. We're going to see the whole scale of probabilities of, of possible outcomes for each ball in play. So uh, instead of thinking of a play as a fly out or a single, we're going to think of it as, oh, that it was 50% chance of being an out, maybe 30% chance of being a single, and a 20% chance of being a double. Uh, okay, so we're going to break down this whole range, and we're going to consider batted balls that way, as opposed to just looking at the outcomes. Um, so the interesting thing about this is its predictive power in small samples, and that's where this is going to be really interesting. Uh, so we, we use a technique called a split half correlation, and what that means is we take a sample of data, you know, we'll take a season of data for, of, of balls in play for a given hitter and we'll, we'll, break it into two, we'll break it randomly into two pieces, okay, two groups. And we'll look at the characteristics of one group and compare them to the characteristics of the other group. And, uh, you know, for what characteristics could we look at? We could look at ground ball velocity, for instance. We'll see how the ground ball velocity in one group compares to the ground ball velocity of the other group. And we do this for all hitters, and we can run a correlation there. And we'll see how consistent they are. And usually the larger your sample, the stronger this correlation is going to be. You have more data and, and this, this, these characteristics are going to be more consistent. Uh, but we can ask ourselves, at what point, what sample size do we reach like a certain threshold of stability, we'll call it. 
uh, stability or consistency between these two groups, between these split halves. So uh, we, one threshold we could use as a, as a stability point of 0.50, so a correlation of 0.50. The higher the correlation, the stronger the, uh, the two groups are related or the two pieces of information are related. Uh, so if we use this benchmark and we can ask ourselves how, how big do we have to make these samples to get something meaningful, something st stable. Uh, so for ground ball velocities, that's about 95 ground balls. That's close to a full season of ground balls usually for a, for a full-time regular major league player. Um, it's, uh, but that's a quicker uh, batting average, for instance, for reference, does not hit this point of stability in a season. It takes you know, multiple years to get to that same level of stability. Uh, fly ball distance stabilizes even faster, 55 fly balls, which is well under a full season. That's a, that's a month or two of a season. Uh, and if you look at the fly ball distance, essentially what this is saying is uh, hitters who tend to hit fly balls deep continue to tend to hit deep fly balls. You know, not really a surprise, but it's, we're, we're measuring this objectively. We're measuring how consistent this is. Uh, and lastly, you look at hang time for hitters. Uh, hang time stabilizes very quickly. So the guys who hit high fly balls tend to continue to hit fly, high fly balls and you only need 35 fly balls, 35 balls in the air to reach that, uh, that level of stability, the same level of stability. So uh, this is, this is uh, interesting because it's, it's, it stabilizes a lot faster than the results-based uh, analysis, looking at the outcomes of the batted balls. Uh, quick glance at pitchers, and we're gonna circle back to hitters for a, few, for a couple more minutes. Um, we can run these similar uh, split half correlations for pitchers. And there is a correlation there. It's not, um, it's not nearly as strong as it is for hitters. Uh, you can look at ground ball velocity, fly ball distance, and hang time, and it, uh, one of the three gets there over the course of a season at 100 fly balls. Uh, the others have a correlation. It's not zero, so we, can't, uh, we shouldn't fully assume that these balls are, are completely random. Uh, but there is, there is a little bit there, uh, but it's not as much. So. Uh, we'll circle back to that. We talked about results-based. So let me walk you through the, um, the model that we're using here. Uh, we constructed a model very similarly to how the range and positioning component of uh, defensive run saved, our defensive metric works. And it looks at uh, batted balls and puts them in similar buckets uh, based on their characteristics and trajectories and, uh, and, and approximates what, uh, what would have happened on average. So independent of that individual uh, event, we can look at what would have happened if that event had happened 100 times over the course of the season. Um, so we, we, this, you know, the factors included in this model are batted ball location, uh, hang time and ground ball velocity for fly balls and ground balls respectively, uh, bat side, so whether it's a right-handed batter or a left-handed batter, important variable, especially infield positioning, uh, but important in the outfield as well. Um, speed, as we saw a few slides ago, we saw how speed made a huge difference on ground balls, uh, as, as we would expect. Uh, and I haven't talked about this one yet, and this is power. Why do we want to adjust for power? Well, uh, what we found without including uh, isolated power as a variable is we had guys like Juan Pierre who would hit shallow fly ball after shallow fly ball, and these would ordinarily go for singles against an average position defense, but because they were shallow fly balls, <coughs> or excuse me, because he was Juan Pierre, the outfielders knew he wasn't gonna hit it over their head. So he plays in a little bit. Uh, ben Revere is probably the modern example, or the more contemporary example. Um, he hits the fly balls shallower, and so the, the outfielders cheat in on him and take away a lot of, a lot of uh, line drives that would have been hits for other guys uh, with outfielders playing a little bit deeper. So we needed to create kind of a proxy for this positioning uh, by using power as a variable. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, and this is actually really important, really interesting uh, variable, uh, and that's park factors. Um, there's, there's a couple aspects of park factors that are, that are important here. One is, uh, well, let me just walk you through the, the traditional park factors first. Uh, the traditional park factors, you look at how many home runs were hit by a team in their home park and how many home runs did they allow in their home park. Compare that to how many they hit and how many they allowed on the road. Uh, you create a multiplier and you, you multi use that multiplier against their batting stats and, and uh, the home runs they allowed and you come up with park adjusted numbers, right? Well, uh, that's reliant on, uh, those don't stabilize very quickly. Those, those take many seasons of data before you get consistent information. Um, and, uh, and, and those, in large part because they're reliant on the outcomes of batted balls. And there's only so many, you know, a couple of, maybe 200 home runs hit over the course of the season, uh, still a relatively small sample. So uh, by looking at the individual batted balls and their trajectories, you know, a fly ball hit, you know, 400 feet to straightaway center field, 
you know, in some ballparks that's a home run, in some ballparks that's not. And if we look at the individual batted balls, we can uh, come up with more accurate park factors uh, rather than just looking at the overall outcomes regardless of, of where the ball went. So we can break this down by left field, center field, right field. Uh, we can look at the depth of the fly balls, et cetera. Um, and that, uh, that has a couple of ramifications. One is it makes more accurate park factors. And two, that means that we can adjust our numbers more accurately for the impact of individual ballparks. Uh, so we're not using the same park factor for Ben Revere as we are for Ryan Howard, for instance, to stick with the Phillies. Uh, and that's an important uh, kind of distinction that we, don't, we haven't always uh, been able to utilize. Uh, the last note on the model here is I'm using five years of data from BIS as the, as the baseline. So we've got a pretty good sample underneath this. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let me, uh, let me walk you through just kind of the results of this, some of the correlations uh, that we're finding from this information. Um, and we're using year-to-year -year correlations. In other words, how consistent is this information from year to year? Uh, and we can look at, uh, for instance, batting runs as, as a baseline for comparison from uh, linear weights, basic, basically. We had uh, uh, a couple of the inventors of, of linear weights uh, on a panel here yesterday, and I know they're around here somewhere. Um, and uh, so we're, you know, this is a, a, you know, one of the recognized uh, standards of batting uh, evaluation is to apply a run value for every batted ball outcome. So a home runs worth 1.4 runs and outs worth, you know, minus 2.5 or point, uh, 0.25, that's a lot of runs, um, minus 0.25 runs uh, per out, uh, something in that ballpark. The numbers change a little bit uh, depending on what sample. So my numbers are, are pretty close to what you might see on fan graphs, for instance, but they're not, they don't 100% uh, match because I'm using slightly different run values and slightly different time period. But um, so using batting runs and linear weights, we get a correlation year to year of about 0.52. Okay, so pretty good, right? Uh, well, if we look at this defense independent batting statistics that I'm gonna walk you through some examples in just a second, the correlation is a lot higher than that, 0.69 from year to year over this five year period. Uh, and in fact, if you use defense independent batting stats, DIBs, we'll call it, uh, if you use DIBs to predict next year's linear weights, next year's batting runs, uh, it's actually better at predicting next year's batting runs than this year's batting runs were, okay? So this is where, this is, this is an important point that we can kind of utilize going forward to, uh, to improve our projections, and we'll get into a little bit of that in a, in a minute. Uh, and the last point I wanted to make here is just how the correlation of the residuals, in other words, uh, there, there is a little bit of a correlation of residuals, which means that some hitters have shown some small ability to outperform this model over time. It's a minor thing, it's a pretty low correlation, and in fact, if you look at the, the 0.18 versus the 0.10 for guys who switch teams, you, there's a, it, it seems like there's a little bit of the context, maybe it's still related to their park factors, um, uh, something related to their team that's probably still sticking with them year to year, but a lot of that is, is uh, wiped out at this point with this approach. Um, so let me walk you through an example. We have Jonathan Lucroy in 2013. Uh, so Jonathan Lucroy had a pretty strong offensive season in 2013, especially for a catcher, uh, a catcher who is uh, who's also known for, for excellent defense. In fact, won our Fielding Bible Award this year, and you'll hear uh, Joe Rosales and Scott Spratt are going to talk about Lucroy here later this morning in, uh, in their presentation on uh, catcher framing and on our strike zone run safe system. Uh, so be sure to stick around for that. But uh, Lucroy, with a, a season that, you know, he had 280, he had 18 home runs, 25 doubles, a pretty strong season, especially for a catcher. That translates to about 10 runs above average. Not average for a catcher, but 10 runs above average overall. You know, very good season. Uh, if we look at his defense independent batting statistics, his dibs, however, uh, we find that actually he should have been even better. He should have hit a couple more doubles, he should have had about 11 more hits overall, an extra home run. Uh, he should have hit closer to 300 uh, as opposed to 280. And his batting runs were, you know, his defense independent batting runs uh, suggested that he should have been worth about an extra 11 runs compared to what his outcomes uh, suggested. Uh, and 11 runs, you know, may or may not seem like a lot, but 11 runs is worth, you know, more than a run, uh, more than one win, right? So this is, uh, this is a big difference in evaluating a hitter, you know, something we've kind of already taken for granted that we can do it pretty well. Well, if we take out the defense and the parks and some of these other, you know, luck variables as we might call them, uh, you can make a you can make a pretty big difference, and I'm I, granted I'm giving you a kind of an outlier here to prove a point, but um, let's take a look at 2014. Look at what he did last year. It was a, I mean you guys probably know he had a fantastic offseason, hit 53 doubles or regular season, hit 53 doubles, which is remarkable and, and very hard for anybody to do. Um, but his batting average was much more in line with his defense independent batting numbers, his dibs from the previous year. 
Uh, his batting runs were much more in line. In fact, they, they beat, they exceeded what his dibs were from the previous year by a little bit. Um, and uh, so we could have seen this coming, potentially. That's, that's kind of the point we're going for here. Uh, and in fact, if you look at his defense independent batting statistics uh, from 2014, from this past year, pretty consistent with his defense independent batting statistics, his dibs from the previous year. Uh, just his results changed, right? So he's hitting balls hard, he's hitting them long, he's, he's making good contact, good quality of contact. That hasn't actually changed. His results did change, though. Uh, I've got two more hitter examples here. So I've got Starling Castro. I want to look at his 2012 season uh, and then his 2013 season to follow up. Uh, Castro, of course, is a you know, shortstop for the Cubs uh, and a, you know, pr a productive offensive player, considering that he's a shortstop especially. Um, driven by a high batting average. So this is, this is something that he kind of lives off of. He has a little bit of pop, you know, 14 home runs, 12 triples that year, in fact. Um, hit 283, which is actually a little bit down from, uh, from his previous years where he hit over 300. Uh, worth about nine runs above average, uh, average major league hitter. Uh, but if we look at his underlying defense, defense independent batting stats, his dibs, uh, in fact, this actually suggests there's, there's a warning sign. Or this is a warning sign of what's going to come next year. Um, his, he actually cost, uh, or he actually overachieved, according to this method, by about 16 hits. Should have hit closer to 263 uh, and would have been worth about 16 fewer runs, you know, 15, 16 fewer runs uh, based on batting runs if his uh, outcomes had gone a different way. So flash forward to 2013, he had his worst year on record. He hit 245, actually, uh, lower than even the, def the dibs suggested from the previous year. Uh, and that was, that was actually a little bit below what his dibs from 2013 would have suggested that he, he would have done. He did set a career high for doubles that year, 34 doubles is, is his career best, but his batting average really suffered. Um, so this was something that we could have seen in the underlying data. We could have seen some warning signs because his dibs for that year, for 2012, were lower than any other year uh, that he's had on record. Um, and of course, you know, he fixed it. He, he got back on track in 2014. It, both his actual numbers and his dibs numbers picked back up. So, you know, we should expect him to continue to, to rebound and, and hit at that level um, going forward unless we start to see an underlying change uh, in his dibs numbers uh, in the future. And I got one more example here for a hitter uh, looking at David Ortiz over the last few years. Uh, David Ortiz's numbers uh, over the last few years, his dibs and his actuals every year are pretty closely in sync. So. Uh, you know, 26 runs in 2010, about 36, 38, depending on which metric you're looking at, uh, in 2011, same thing, 2012, 2013, very valuable hitter, uh, you know, incredible hitter, Hall of Fame hitter, uh, when he does retire, when he does hang him up, uh, or at least five years after that, right? But uh, what, what's interesting is you look at his 2014, uh, his, his defense independent batting statistics suggest that he was the same hitter. He was still hitting the ball hard, hitting it far. Uh, in fact, it suggested that it was one of his more valuable seasons at, you know, 42, 43 runs above average, an average hitter. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at his, uh, you look at his batting average, it was the lowest in this sample here by far. Uh, even though he hit 35 home runs, it suggested that there was still some power that, uh, that he, he didn't uh, capitalize on, he didn't take advantage of. Maybe he hit those uh, deep fly balls to the wrong part of the ballpark, or he hit them on the road um, instead of uh, taking advantage of the pesky pole or the green monster. Um, so, uh, so this is this is kind of an interesting thing to to watch David Ortiz as he um, nears the end of his career, whenever that may be. Let's see if uh, if he's going to keep hitting at this strong pace. His defense independent numbers suggest that he will, um, or at least he should have in 2014 been a little bit better than than he actually was. Uh, so we'll see if that you know. That can change quickly, of course, if he starts uh, hitting weaker contact. And, and I think it was back in 2010, actually, he did start the year with a lot weaker contact. Um, and his fly balls were hanging in the air a lot longer, and they weren't going as far. Uh, but he rectified that by about May and, and got right back on, on track. So it's something to keep an eye on um, uh, with him as he nears the end of his career, when he, uh, whether he's going to hang around and continue to be productive for a couple more years, or if he's going to uh, reach the end of the line. So let's flip back to the pitching side for a minute, and let's look at those correlations. Um, as I promised before, pitching runs, linear weights for pitchers. Um, I, I should have pointed this out before. I'm only looking at balls in play here. I wanted to take out the non-ball in play events because we're not, we're not adjusting those. Those are the same. We're only looking at balls in play here. And I didn't want the correlations to be kind of wash, washing out the effect that we're trying to measure here. 
So I took out all non-ball and play events. Uh, if you added them back in, the hitters and the pitcher correlations are going to go back up. Um, pitching runs about 0.17 correlation year to year on balls and play. Again, it's there. Not huge. Not nearly as significant as it is for hitters. Uh, his dips correlation, 0.27, was significantly higher than that. Uh, his dips year to year correlation, uh, not his, but it's the model's uh, correlation year to year was a lot better. Uh, and in fact, if you use dips to project next year's pitching runs, it actually predicts about as well as this year's pitching runs. Uh, so not a significant improvement on the pitching side. Um, and this is kind of a, uh, an interesting point um, that, uh, that on the pitching side, you know, it's, it's such a small um, area of consistent or so small consistency from year to year. Do we want to give pitchers credit for their balls in play? If they allow a lot of hard contact one year, what this is suggesting is he might not allow that same level of hard contact next year, but he did allow hard contact. It might not be the defense's fault. That, uh, that all these hits went in for line drives or they felt or they were hard ground balls through the infield. Uh, but what, you know, do we, who are we going to penalize then, right? Um, do we just give the hitters credit for doing a good job? Do we penalize the pitcher for allowing hard contact? I don't think there's a right or wrong answer on this front. And this is kind of off on a little bit of a tangent from where I want to go here. But, uh, but that's kind of an interesting dilemma that we face. I know Sean Foreman's here and we talk about pitcher war and how to, uh, how to evaluate uh, this aspect when we try to evaluate pitchers and compare them for Cy Young awards, et cetera. Um, and we're going to do an example like this in a minute. I have uh, two more points that I want, or one more point that I wanted to make here, though, and that's um, actually why these correlations are a little bit understated for the, def the dips numbers and the dibs numbers. And that's this: that the the pitching runs have not the pitching runs linear weights. I have not park adjusted those. The park ad the, the dips numbers and the dibs numbers have been park adjusted. If you leave that park adjustment in there, like I did with the linear weights, it actually artificially inflates the correlation because you're leaving the impact of that ballpark in there year after year. So if you stay in a hitter's ballpark, you're going to continue to have good outcomes, provided you can take advantage of that. Um, and if you, if you switch, you know, obviously then it's going, to, it's going to lower the correlation for that particular guy. But, uh, but the majority of hitters do stay in the same ballpark year after year. So there's, there's an argument to be made that the correlations or the difference between the dibs and dips approach are actually, the difference is, is much greater than what it's showing here just by this study because we have park effects in one and not in the other. Uh, okay, so let me show you the example from 2013. The 2014 Cy Young Awards are pretty straightforward. Uh, the dibs or the dips winners in, uh, in the Cy Young Awards are the same as the, the uh, actual Cy Young Award winners. It's close, you know, Corey Kluber made a run at it for, with Felix, but uh, I think that's, that's kind of uh, not an interesting example because I think we, uh, we all kind of agree about that at this point. But uh, 2013 provides some interesting insights. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can look at, for instance, the fact that Clayton Kershaw had a 252 batting average on balls in play, but his dips BABIP suggested that based on his quality of contact, uh, that he deserved to allow about 31% you know, hits, about a 310 BABIP, uh, based on the balls in play he allowed. Some of that he got spared because he was in Dodger Stadium. Some of that, you know, maybe his defense helped him out a little bit, uh, but, uh, or, or other factors. Maybe runners just tripped on their way to first base or whatever the case may be. Um, but he benefited from that. Uh, and so if you compare his pitching runs to his dips runs, you see a significant drop there. Uh, Matt Harvey is kind of a... Depends on how you want to handle Matt Harvey because he didn't pitch the full season, uh, but his, his dips runs actually go ahead, uh, surge ahead of uh, of Kershaw when you take into account the fact that Kershaw's batting average uh, on balls in play was so high, and that his his um, hit the actual batted balls he allowed were <clears throat> pretty hard contact or, or much uh, actually higher than the league average. Uh, you see Chris Sale on there making an interesting case in the AL uh, pitching in a hitter's ballpark, and he actually should have allowed by this. Uh, by, by this metric, you know, still an even higher uh, batting average on balls in play, but um, he comes in at the top of the AL leaderboard, uh, in this case, over Max Scherzer, who had higher strikeout rate and higher uh, win total and ERA, and did win the award, uh, but plays in a little bit bigger ballpark. So, uh, interesting conversation starters here, uh, and that's what we love to do, is debate awards, right? Um, so I want to touch last, lastly here on a couple of small sample benefits uh, of this approach um, and things that we can learn, things that we can build off of <clears throat> using this approach or a similar approach. Uh, Tom Tango, Mitchell Lickman, and Andy Dolphin came out with a book a number of years ago and they looked at things like lefty-righty splits and how, uh, how long it takes that information to stabilize 
uh, over larger, and how much, how much of a sample size uh, do you need for a hitter's splits to indicate a true difference in, uh, from the league average in his splits, his, his righty lefty splits, and, and other things that they studied in the book. Um, so I did this, I didn't I print the correlations here, but I did study, I did look at the um, lefty righty splits correlation from year to year, similar to how we looked at the, correlate, the year to year correlations on the other slides. Uh, and found that it improved when you look at trajectory-based information. It was significant improvement, especially because we're working with even smaller samples uh, when we're looking at partial season data as opposed to full season data. Uh, so these trajectory-based, the impact of these trajectory-based and defense-independent statistics is its greatest when we're working with small samples and we're trying to measure small, excuse me, small, small sample changes in performance. Um, another thing I looked at is first half, second half performance. There was a, you know, I didn't look at any other years other than that individual season. I correlated first half performance with second half performance, and it was stronger, uh, as you might expect, you know, based on everything that we've learned so far today, uh, with the defense independent statistics than it was with just the results, uh, looking at the results of the outcomes. So this is something we look at in season, excuse me, in season projections, look at daily projections, potentially for fantasy purposes, et cetera. Uh, this can have a real impact, really improve our projection systems that way, especially if we're trying to pick up on uh, something, if a hitter changed his approach or has a new swing or, or has really improved his underlying ability. You know, usually we have to wait for a season of data and then we're still not even sure if that's a real change uh, in his performance. You know, you think back to Jose Batista in 2009, 2010, uh, how he just made it such a, a significant jump in his performance level. Uh, well, kind of the question that I had, I know a lot of people had, is he going to be able to do it again? Right, um, and he did, uh, and it was due to an underlying change in you know batted balls, and so we can use this to kind of back up our confidence in these sorts of things. Um, and then you know we could start looking at hot and cold streaks again. I know that's a big topic uh, for fantasy folks as well. Um, not to get too far away from some of the uh, the real life applications in in Major League Baseball and with organizations, but uh, these are the kinds of things we can kind of take a closer look at. We can take a new look at. Uh, not using the outcomes that we've always used to study these things, but using the batted ball trajectories and the batted ball information that's going to be more stable and more indicative of underlying realities. Um, so just to wrap up, we've, we've created, a better batting and, uh, created better batting and pitching statistics, right? Uh, more indicative of their actual ability and their actual performance, independent of some of the, the uh, context around them, some of the factors around them. Um, We've, uh, and that has impl implications for projections as well, right? Uh, creating better projection systems, especially based on lower, uh, lower smaller samples of data. Uh, this consistency in small samples opens up some, reopens some doors for analysis. Uh, and finally, you know, park factors is a big thing uh, that, you know, it's always, it's always good to have more accurate park factors. It's something that we haven't really been able to do too much of, um, at least in the public sphere. So. Uh, I want to quickly acknowledge um, my daughter who helped with the coding of this. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I'll let her know. Um, she was, uh, she's seven months old. She was helping me type the coding and, you know, pressing space bar a lot really drove me crazy. But um, uh, I want to thank Joe Rosales and Scott Spratt who helped with a lot of the research and the concepts on this uh, at BIS, my colleagues at BIS, as well as the rest of the Baseball Info, Info Solutions team. I'm fortunate to work with a bunch of great guys, a lot of dedicated individuals who um, who do a lot of great work and, and we have, uh, it's, it's turned into a lot of success for our company so we're very excited about all that. Uh, thanks to Sabre for having me here and uh, thanks to you for your attention. Any questions? Sean. Right. Um, it, you know, the guys you expect, uh, you know, guys like Miguel Cabrera hit hard ground balls. They don't always have a high batting average on hard ground balls because he doesn't have the speed to take advantage of it. But, you know, the guys that hit, you know, a lot of line drives, a lot of hard, um, uh, you know, Joey Votto makes a lot of hard contact, rarely pops a ball up. That was one of the examples, if you remember, two years ago. Never hits a pop-up on that tornado graph. The upper left quadrant was completely barren. Um, and he's one of the few guys who's able to achieve that year in, year out. Um, those guys really stand out in terms of the quality of their contact and no huge surprises there. I think there are some, uh, the, the places where we can learn are the guys that we wouldn't expect. You know, the guys who in, maybe they make one year uh, appearance in the major leagues, maybe their, their uh, performance doesn't, you know, doesn't stand out based on the results, but uh, 
but based on a small sample, uh, their quality of contact suggests a you know, productive career ahead. <coughs> Any other questions? <laughs> um, that's a great question. I don't have an answer. Um, and I swear we didn't arrange this, but BIS is starting to track injury information this year. Uh, I'll wrap up. Thank you. Um, but uh, we're starting to track injury information this year on in-game injuries, you know, fouls of office foot, and, and we're going to be able to measure uh, that kind of thing going forward. So that's a great question. Uh, and I think I'm getting the sign that uh, I need to cut it off and let the next presenter come up. So thank you for your time and attention.